Here's one of the great unanswered mysteries about the modern climate cult in America. Okay, on one hand, they say that carbon emissions are the enemy, that carbon itself is the enemy. Carbon is the source of global climate change, which, by the way, in the 1970s was supposed to be an ice age that was coming. About 40, 50 years later, it's now the opposite. It's global warming that's going to destroy the planet. And so you would think that a movement so committed to reducing carbon emissions, applying net zero standards by 2050, scope three emissions caps across the economy, a call on all of us to use less carbon in our daily way of life, you would think that this movement would embrace the best known form of carbon-free energy production known to mankind. That is nuclear energy. And yet you see a paradox. Many of the very people who are pushing the anti-carbon agenda in the United States are exactly the same folks who are also staunchly opposed to nuclear energy. Now, why is that? There's a couple things going on here. First, as I say, many of the same people, who is that? It's actually the federal government itself, the same federal government today, the Biden administration, that is hostile to drilling for oil, to drilling for, to fracking for natural gas, to producing fossil fuels in the United States is perfectly fine with shifting that production to other places in the world. But they are also the administration that continues to adopt a hostile anti-nuclear policy and anti-nuclear regulatory regime in the United States. Why is that? Well, the first thing that's going on is that actually it has nothing to do with the climate. It has to do with an anti-growth agenda in the United States itself, an agenda that says that part of the problem is that we should live with less. We should learn to live more simple lifestyles, that we should learn to apologize for our modern way of life and our success in America so the rest of the world can catch up. And nuclear energy throws a wrench into that plan. Because if you adopt nuclear energy in America, you might actually, God forbid, solve their own climate disaster crisis their energy, clean energy crisis, and yet do it in a way that still allows GDP growth to remain on a steep slope in America, which would solve, which would prevent them from addressing the deeper problem they want to address, which is their agenda of global equity. That's what this is about. It is about making the West and America in particular apologize for its sins of GDP growth in the past by applying shackles then to future growth to allow places like China on the other side of the world to catch up. And I think nuclear energy is part of what calls that bluff. And we're going to get into that today. And also broadly, the anti-energy agenda, the anti-production agenda in the United States with a special guest that we have today in the studio, Neil Chatterjee, who was chairman of FERC. So he was the lead of the five people who sit on the board of FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission from 2017 to 2020 in the Trump administration. And prior to that, had a policymaking background that's really relevant to the discussion we're about to have. Neil, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Yeah, it's good to be here. So so it'd be good to hear a little bit about your background and what landed you in the position of leading FERC. And then we'll get a little bit of the nuts and bolts of what that experience was all about. And we'll come to the nuclear agenda after that. But what led you? You know, What was the journey in short form that brought you to your seat in leading FERC? And, and what did you expect coming into the job? Yeah, so going all the way back, my two loves in life were uh, sports and politics, and uh, my athletic career sort of stalled out in the eighth grade when I stopped growing. So I thought I might, uh, you know, do the next best thing. Self awareness is a good thing, man. Self awareness is a good thing. Uh, pursue a career in public policy. Wasn't exactly sure what direction that would take. Uh, went to college. Uh, went to law school. Actually, did a joint degree program. Two years of law school, a year of business school, uh, and a final year of law school at the University of Cincinnati. Hometown, and, all right. Uh, there and we so, go. Uh, um, was in business school on September 11, 2001. Decided uh, that day that I had to serve my country in some capacity. Wasn't entirely certain how to go about it. My best friend from business school got a job with then Congressman Rob Portman, who was representing the Cincinnati area in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, a year later, I come back. I finish law school. Uh, I went to visit my friend and I said, hey, how does one get a job up here? How do you work in public policy? And he said, Neil, no one cares that you went to law school, you went to business school, you don't have any experience. The best I can do, Congressman Portman is on this really important committee, the House Committee on Ways and Means. We can get you an internship at the House Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, at the time, I had a well-paying job at a law firm in Cincinnati and my rent in Northern Kentucky was about $400 a month. Moved to D.C., 
was paid a stipend of $1,400 a month to be an intern on the House Committee on Ways and Means. My rent was $1,650. But I knew that if I was passionate about the work, uh, that I could be good at it. And uh, I, I, I worked my way up. I, I worked hard. I did every job that was ever asked of me, whether it was getting coffee or making copies or running errands. Uh, eventually gained the, the trust and confidence of my home state senator. I'm from Kentucky originally, uh, Mitch McConnell. Uh, started working in his office, serving the people of Kentucky. He has two jobs, senior senator from Kentucky, but also party leader in the Senate. I wound up moving over uh, to serve him in his capacity as both Senate minority leader and majority leader. And what is a little bit maybe unknown to a lot of your listeners is bipartisan boards and commissions like the SEC, FERC, the NRC, they're bipartisan by configuration. They always have to have someone from the other party serving. and the arrangement and, and where's that rule set by the way so it's custom in the senate it was it's bob just custom, dole huh? bob dole and trent uh, or i'm sorry it was it was bob dole and tom daschle struck an agreement during the clinton era that the senate leader of the party that doesn't control the white house would identify that party's candidates for bipartisan boards and commissions so for the 8 years that president obama was in office senator mcconnell picked the republicans who served on these various Boards that are in the administrative state that, that, serve, that are under the executive but branch, but they are there to keep an eye on the majority. So no more. So for agency like FERC, no more than three of the five members can come from one political party. The idea being that not you, by rule, but by custom. Well, by rule, by statute, but how the appointment is made. You are ultimately nominated by the White House, but in reality, it is the Senate leader of the party that doesn't control the White House that is submitting you to the White House for consideration. And, and the custom is the White House will accept that. So the, there are parameters. During the Obama administration, the, uh, you couldn't have been a federally registered lobbyist in the two prior years, and you couldn't have made an ad hominem attack against the president. You could have criticized Obama's policies, but if you had attacked him in a personal way, they would refuse to nominate you. And that's in a statute or a regulation? This or was Obama a- era. Custom. They, they just said, Senator McConnell, we will nominate your people as long as they don't run afoul of these two considerations. During the Trump administration, Trump PPO, to their credit, for the most part, nominated the Democrats that Senator Schumer had sent up for these various bipartisan boards and commissions. Sometimes they probably took a little bit longer to send the Democrats up than Senator Schumer would have liked, but ultimately they all got put up. Now during the Biden administration, we'll see. Uh, There's a Republican vacancy coming up on FERC this year, And I'm very, very curious to see how the Biden administration will handle it. Will they honor the tradition of nominating Senator McConnell's picks? This is the first Republican appointment to FERC during the Biden administration. And the vacancy comes up just because someone's stepping off or because they're term limited? So yes, uh, interesting question. So at FERC, because it's an independent agency with a bipartisan configuration, each of the members serves a staggered five-year term. And so the idea is you could theoretically outlast the term of the president that appointed you, and that is supposed to better enable independent judgment. Who set this up? The statute set this up? This is the statute uh, that that set the creation of the agency in the late 1970s. And does the president, as the statute is set up, at least on its face, have the power to remove and replace those members? No, you'd have to be impeached unless, you you know, uh, on ethical grounds. You cannot be removed because a president disagrees with the policy agenda that you're pursuing. So this is interesting. I mean, I think that just to take a, a, a little bit of a stop here, because the SEC works the same way. What are some other agencies? I mean, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Nuclear works, Regulatory Commission works the same way. The Commodities Future Trading where Corporation. There's five. Where there's five. Some of them are less. The Surface Transportation Board, I believe, only has three. Um, but there are a number of agencies that fall into this category. This ad, These administrative agencies that are independent of the the cabinet agencies where you have a unilateral administrator. Here you have- Sort of like the Federal Reserve is in that category too, I suppose. Federal Reserve quasi fits in that same category. Yeah. That is correct. And so just to, just to sort of pause here for a second, as you probably know, this is an issue of deep importance to me. Yeah. Article two of the constitution says the President of the United States runs the executive branch of the government. How is it that Congress creates certain parts of that executive branch, which supposedly sits under the president, reports into the president, 
without actually having accountability to anyone. And, and, I, and this is first personal to you, right? So, so I'm, I'm sure you were great. We're going to get into your tenure in FERC, but let's just talk about the first principles for a second. Who are you accountable to? That's a great question. So uh, you're accountable to essentially Congress in that the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee has oversight over the commission. House Energy can they and Commerce, you? they cannot remove you, but it's they can bring you in. Now, here is where it's interesting. Uh, and I, I've actually come to see how this system can and does not work, but it can work positively. This past year, uh, the chairman of the commission who took over after I departed, uh, in my view, took the commission in a radically different direction, in an, a partisan direction, particularly when it came to the review of applications for natural gas infrastructure, for pipelines, for liquefied natural gas export facilities. He took steps that I think were well beyond FERC's statutory authority. Now, where he got into trouble was that his term was up and he wanted to seek another term. That means he would have had to have been confirmed by the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. After he proposed these really radical rule changes, Senate Energy brought him in and just absolutely skewered him and the other commissioners for pursuing this. And ultimately, the committee decided to not move forward with his nomination, and he is now off the commission. That is an example of where the, the nominations process can play a significant role in oversight. Because short of that, Senate e &R can drag you before them and can ask you a bunch of really difficult questions that can make your life miserable, but they can't remove you. In this instance, because the chairman wanted another term, he was vulnerable to that oversight and we were able to rein in his radical agenda. If he hadn't wanted a, a second term, I'm not so certain he would have acted to, to pull back on these rules in the manner that he did. So oversight combined so with a bit the of a coincidence, though. It's a coincidence. It doesn't always work in that way. Yeah, I mean, it's just, as an American, you know, an interesting thing to see, right? You have congressmen who have to be reelected every four years, a president who's accountable to the people who elect him. But here, once these people are appointed, really in policymaking roles, right? This isn't yeah. some technocratic engineer here, which you can talk about that as a separate category too, but real policymakers, right? the five people who serve on the, I guess you'd call it the board, the commission of FERC, commission, yes. the commission of FERC, same thing with respect to the SEC. Once appointed, they can neither be removed by the president, nor can they be removed by Congress who actually, or by the Senate who actually put them there. I don't know. I, I don't love it <laughs> on, on first principles. Look, there were certainly times, and look, I'm proud of my record and what we achieved. I'm sure you were. Tenure, yeah, you were great. Yeah. There were times where I was uncomfortable because no one elected me to anything. Now, typically and historically, an agency like FERC should operate in a quasi judicial manner. About 75% of the agency's work is responding to filings that come into the commission. So you're really acting more like judges than policymakers than legislators. But there is about 25% discretion that a chairman has to pursue issues and matters outside the scope of what gets filed day to day, bread and butter of the commission. And what I found is happening increasingly in the energy space is that in the absence of real federal leadership on energy policy, yep. more and more of the critical decisions are falling to agencies like FERC. You bet. And I didn't like the fact that I was an unelected bureaucrat that had the authority to make the consequential decisions that I did. My strong preference would be for, if we're going to alter course, FERC is governed by two statutes, the Federal Power Act and the Natural Gas Act. In my view, we have to adhere to the law as prescribed in the FPA and the NGA. And to the extent we veer outside of our lanes, that's inappropriate in the absence of direct and explicit guidance from Congress. But more and more, what you are seeing is people are coming into these agencies, they're frustrated that Congress is unable to legislate in this arena, and they're doing it through the rulemaking process, and that's problematic to me. The check on that is the courts, is that when an agency oversteps, you can litigate it, you can challenge it. That takes it, a long time. And, but it, and it's expensive. It's very expensive. And a lot of times what ends up happening is parties take incremental defeats because rather than fighting it out, they give up an inch, 
and then they give up an inch and then they give up an inch. And the next thing you know, we've completely transformed the law without Congress directing us to do so. And that is problematic. That said, the one reason I think it is important for an independent FERC to exist is at the end of the day, when it comes to electricity and the deployment of electricity, you have natural monopolists and you do need a regulator. I think the overwhelming majority of Americans from conservatives to liberals would agree that you do need to regulate natural monopolies. Uh, so FERC plays an important role. What is unfortunate is that in the absence of congressional action, FERC has too much on its plate for my comfort. What's an example? I mean, you've had such a front row seat to this. You speak honestly about this in a way that so few who are alumnuses or alumni of the, administra the administrative bureaucracy do. I want to take advantage of that. Sure. What's an example of a policymaking decision that functionally fell on your lap that you don't believe should have actually been made by an unelected bureaucrat like yourself? Outstanding question. So FERC, in addition to having an authority of overseeing applications for natural gas pipelines, liquefied natural gas export facilities, also oversees the country's competitive wholesale power markets. There are different regions of the country in which we've deregulated and opened up electricity to competition. In theory, I'm a conservative. I believe in markets. I believe markets should derive positive benefits for the economy, for the consumer. But what is happening is in the absence of as I've mentioned repeatedly, federal legislative guidance, particularly on decarbonization, states have taken it upon themselves to pursue their own policies regarding their local decarbonization goals. So FERC oversees this market, 13 state, multi-state market, and some of the states within that market were pursuing policies to subsidize their own resources. I'm huh. a conservative. I believe in states' rights. I absolutely believe that states ought to have the ability to make decisions around their own generation mix. But when they participate in a multi-state market, if state A is pursuing policies that advantage its resources and state D is suffering because its generators aren't being dispatched because they're not being subsidized and state D doesn't even support state A's public policy objective, at that point, I felt it was incumbent upon the federal regulator to step in. And my colleagues and I- Because you effectively have one state unwittingly sub subsidizing the choices of another. Wittingly. I mean, they, they're doing it deliberately to gain advantage in a competitive market. We moved forward something that was very wonky and technical that I didn't think ought to be that controversial called a minimum offer price rule. And what our rule basically said was that you have to bid in your true cost you can't bid in your subsidized costs. Because what was happening in a lot of instances is certain states were so richly subsidizing their preferred sources of generation, say offshore wind, that they were bidding negatively and it was impossible <laughs> like, to like compete against California them. or Massachusetts or what? Uh, I mean, so it was it's uh, Maryland, okay. Delaware, New Jersey, you know, were all subsidizing resources. And so generators in Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, who also participate in this same market, their resources were being denied, you know, being dispatched in the forward capacity auction because of these subsidies. So all we said was bid your true cost. You can't bid your subsidized cost. I didn't think this was a particularly controversial thing. It, it was a market. Bid your true cost step. in order to get what? So, so in, in order to get dispatched in the auction. So you have an auction, resources bid into the auction. Auction for? A forward capacity market. Got so it. capacity markets are basically insurance policies in electricity markets. They pay resources to be available backup. when they're needed. And as backup, as basically. Backups. Yep. And I think the political left has come to view capacity markets as a lifeline to fossil fuel generators. And so to meet their climate objectives, they're going after these capacity payments and they're subsidizing their preferred renewable generators to undercut these uh, uh, plants that are necessary to maintain reliability. That's my foremost obligation at FERC, I really felt was the reliability of the grid, to make sure that when Americans hit the switch, the lights come on. And what is happening now in these markets, because you're, not, you're no longer having engineers make decisions around resource adequacy, politicians are making these decisions, and you're having plants that are necessary for reliability and affordability they're being retired prematurely before their balancing resources are ready to go. 
And so we saw this in California. We saw this in the Midwest this past year. We've seen it repeatedly in the Northeast. Certain sources of generation get shut down. Their replacements aren't ready to go yet. And you wind up potentially facing electricity curtailments, rolling blackouts, brownouts, compromising reliability, security, and affordability. You think because of tilting the scales of auctions that certain states were unable to actually compete because certain states were subsidizing the ability to bid even negative prices because they wanted to favor right. renewable. Politicians were overruling the engineers. Yep. Yep. Interesting. So, so that's an example of a maybe a good policy decision that fell on your desk that you were making. Sure, and it got overturned. So, but this it got is why elections anyway. have consequences. So, we we pushed this forward. I believe it was a market protective step. Uh, the 2020 election happens. Uh, a new chairman is appointed at the commission, and they walk back what we did. And today, that region, that market is facing the same untenable situation that they faced when we first embarked on this rulemaking. The regions, the markets actually came to us and said, the status quo is untenable. You need to make a decision one way or the other, either dissolve these markets or make them work, send accurate signals. I opted to try and protect the market. New chairman comes in, reverses course on what we did. So look, one of my objectives, this is now starting at a 50,000 foot sure. level here is to say that the US needs to abandon the demands of what I call the climate cult. It's become so ingrained in every aspect of even what you measure in terms of what you subsidize. But that's a very high level declaration. Okay, there's a lot of things that could mean. In your corner of the world, yeah. in your corner of the administrative state, let's say I'm as president of the United States setting that forward as a policy objective of the US, part of unleashing the American economy, is to lift the restraints, take off the handcuffs imposed by the climate change movement. How would that translate into action from your vantage point in the markets that you're familiar with? Yeah, look, I actually think I have a lot of credibility in this area because I'm not hostile to clean energy. I'm actually very bullish and supportive of clean energy. I think there's a lot of money to be made in the energy transition via clean energy. I'm excited about solar and the possibility of solar plus storage. But if we don't address questions around the intermittency of solar and we don't get a breakthrough in long-term storage, I am not prepared to sacrifice reliability and affordability into the future on the promise of what technology can deliver. We've got to maintain that reliability and affordability today. And there are ways that we can do that, but it is going to involve fossil fuels. I do not foresee in your or my lifetime the United States of America being in a position where we don't have fossil fuels, particularly natural gas. Natural gas is flexible. It can be ramped up and ramped down to match the intermittency of wind and solar because the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, and we haven't yet had that breakthrough in storage. So we're going to need gas. You made an interesting point. We're going to need nuclear. You made an interesting point at the opening where you talked about how nuclear power is our single greatest form of carbon-free baseload power, and yet climate activists don't support nuclear power. They also, and this is very telling, don't support carbon capture and sequestration. And this has been particularly frustrating to me because there is not a realistic future in which we don't need gas. If the climate activists truly believe that decarbonization was the ultimate end game and the ultimate end goal, they should absolutely embrace and do everything possible to move forward the technology of carbon capture and sequestration. Here is why they do not. And, and the, the ugly truth of it is like, they're not even hiding it anymore. Liquefied natural gas exports, perfect example. The U.S. is saving Europe right now. Sure. When it comes to U.S. LNG, not only is there a positive economic benefit and it leads to growth, GDP it's growth, geopolitical. job growth, geopolitical gives our allies an alternative to, to Russian gas. Here's the thing. We do it cleaner and better here than anywhere else. I've seen you speak about methane leakage. Yep. Our ability to control methane emissions is vastly superior to Russia's. Clean U.S. LNG displacing Russian gas in the global market not only is good for the U.S. economy and geopolitically, also for the environment. So why aren't environmentalists embracing the role that U.S. LNG can play, even if you add carbon capture and sequestration to it? Because if we actually can produce LNG in a carbon-free way through carbon capture, that means gas is around forever. That means we're going to continue to be able to utilize natural gas, and that exposes the game. 
They don't want natural gas to continue. They want to end natural gas production and development right now. So even though there's this positive win-win-win, economic, geopolitical, and environmental benefit, they're denying those benefits. Not, and it's exposing. Decarbonization isn't the end game. It's what you have nailed upon. There are broader societal objectives here beyond just addressing carbon emissions. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's not even, my opinion, is that it's not even that they're hostile to natural gas as an endgame. That's just a symptom of the same reason they're hostile to nuclear and even many of these climate activists to hydroelectric energy, is that it's part of an anti-growth agenda in the country that is fundamentally hostile to Western and American growth in itself. And so their vision of the climate movement is it is a way to limit energy production and utilization in the West while applying differential standards to developing nations, by the way, China claims to claim developing nation status to allow for parity, for global, for the realization of global equity. That's what this is largely about. Now, I want to be clear about my position, uh, and then we can you know, move on and get into the substance of this, but I point these things out to understand the best arguments for decarbonization and then to point out, I think, the hypocrisies, even if you did believe in that agenda, you would be doing things very differently with respect to your embrace of nuclear energy or hydroelectric energy or natural gas combined with, I mean, carbon capture. I mean, what is liquefied natural gas? You capture, you capture carbon, you liquefy it, you sell it, you regasify it in the other side of the world in Europe as a natural gas export. Great. You're making money doing that. That's a market version of carbon capture. I have my own views on how much we should be subsidizing carbon capture, which is where the rubber hits the road for me, which is I don't even believe that decarbonization is a worthy goal in and of itself. So I, I know you alluded to the – and we're, we're allowed to have different views of this, but you, you alluded to the energy transition. I have not yet seen a case grounded in human flourishing for that energy transition. If, you're, if anti-impact is your framework, sure, if, if you want to bring down carbon emissions, then it's just a question of how do you transition to carbon-free energy production, and then we're in the game of the energy transition. I personally, I'm a little bit of a, you know, maybe outside the Overton window on this right now. I don't think it'll be outside the Overton window for long, but I'm of the camp that that itself is a, is a false idol. It's a false framework that we should abandon the anti-impact framework itself, which is an anti-carbon framework, and start with first principles of what actually promotes human prosperity, net on the whole, net of all costs. And I think that viewed differently, that's to me what unshackling ourselves from the climate cult means, is we abandon even the very framework of the, trend, the so-called transition itself. I don't think there has to be a transition. Now, I understand what the proponents of the transition say, and then I can point out why many of their claims are hypocritical on their own terms with respect to nuclear, with respect to LNG, with respect to hydroelectric. But at my core, I think that that's itself the wrong framework. The framework ought to be what promotes human prosperity on balance. And I think that's going to involve quite possibly more than just your and my lifetimes, but our grandchildren's or our great-grandchildren's lifetimes, fossil fuels being here to stay without apologizing for it. That's just where I land on this. I mean, you make a really significant point in that if you look at you know, the history of humanity, this is the first energy transition that will be driven by policy. Yep, as opposed to the market. Every previous energy transition that mankind has encountered, technology has provided a new energy source, energy delivery mechanism, and policy adapted to keep up with that new innovation, that new energy delivery mechanism. This is the first time that policy is going to drive the energy transition. And there's definitely concern there, and we have to focus on it. Look, people think it's boring to talk about reliability. Reliability is essential. And look, I'm not someone who thinks that reliability should be weaponized to slow down or eliminate the energy transition, but we also can't sweep it under the rug and just wish that we are going to be able to transition to net zero without potentially um, compromising reliability. And we have totally taken our eyes off of reliability in pursuit of this policy objective. And I think one thing that the war in Ukraine is showing us is the role energy security plays as well. 
the war in Ukraine in many ways is an energy-driven war. Of course it is. Putin knew, he gets his financial strength from oil. His political dominance over Western Europe, or over Germany in particular, comes because he controls the gas. And I think he recognized that Germany has made a series of energy policy decisions moving away from coal to meet their decarbonization goals. Post Fukushima, moving away from nuclear power, becoming totally dependent on Russian gas to supplement their renewables. I think Putin was banking on Germany and Western Europe relenting in their support for Ukraine because they need the gas. No doubt too about much. it. We, Putin would not have gone for Ukraine if the United States were capable of supplying itself and Western and, Europe completely. And, and again, he knew it. Our, our, and we're, we are in a position to save Europe right now, but our own government is sending mixed signals about what the role of natural gas is in the US. But further than that, there's this big push now after the passage of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act um, to, to you know, move to a clean energy economy here at home. If we don't dom successfully domesticate the clean energy supply chain and develop critical minerals here and, and build the component parts to renewable energy here in the US, then we could find ourselves in a situation where we're retiring our conventional forms of fossil fuel generation, replacing them with clean energy technologies. It's dependent and, on China. And we're suddenly dependent on China for the component parts. And that is something that, again, is being just swept aside in the in the zeal to decarbonize. We're taking our eyes off of energy security. And so people could say, well, the Inflation Reduction Act made investments in bringing that supply chain home. That's true. You know what? It's going to be significantly more expensive to build these, the, the reason that I'm a big believer in the economic case for, for solar plus storage right now is because it's cheap. It might not be that cheap if we got to suddenly start building all these panels here at home. And we have to start asking these moral questions. Because the panels come from Xinjiang. And, and we have to understand that. And, yep. and people just ignore that fact because the pursuit is retiring fossil fuels and other moral questions be damned. Yeah, th there's, a, there's an interesting just a meta observation of our conversation here that I think it's important to put a fine point on. I love knowledgeable voices like yours because it forces the other side, the, you know, I would say the broadly the anti-carbon, but really the anti-growth agenda to answer for its endless hypocrisies. I do think that there's an interesting, you know, distinction between where you and I are on this. And I think it's just worth, you know, double clicking on that for sure. a second to sort of see it. Because I think that your perspective represents, I would say, mainstream, thoughtful Republican um, policy perspective today. Kind of where, not surprising, you worked in the Trump administration, kind of where the Trump administration was on this, which is to effectively accept the premise that there is an energy transition ongoing, and then to ask ourselves how we can most sensibly effectuate or participate in po policymakers participate in effectuating that energy transition away from fossil fuels towards whatever that future holds solar carbon capture part of it wind part of it and then sensibly saying that nuclear has to be part of that too i'm very sympathetic to a lot of that much more so than the direction that the biden administration and the modern left wants to go which is really just anti fossil fuel as it ended its own right and then pick favorites in subsidizing wind and solar, which couldn't stand on their own two feet in absence of those subsidies. So that That's, I think, the scope of the Overton window of debate between thoughtful Republicans and, and Democrats who are on board of this agenda. I think I want to go to a very different place as U.S. president, which is to start from the observation you made which is that this is not a market-driven energy transition. Let's just make that observation on its own face. This energy transition is driven top-down by a vision, a mandate that we have to get to net zero by a certain point in time, net zero carbon emissions by, say, 2050, which is the popularized global goal. I reject that premise. And I think that actually, if we viewed it that way, then the idea that we should be subsidizing solar at all or not subsidizing it, but trading it off through having cheap component parts come from China goes away. Nuclear might be still part of the picture just because it's abundant and plentiful and scalable and maybe a worthy investment over a long enough time horizon to pair with fossil fuels for reasons that have nothing to do with the climate. But one of the things that I'm committed to 
in my presidency should we be successfully, you know, successful in this campaign elected in November of next year is actually just changing that entire framework really to take a sledgehammer to even the idea of the transition itself. I, I don't think we have to accept as a premise that there is or ought to be such a thing as an energy transition because that is a top-down policy dictate rather than something that's actually the outcome of a market movement towards a new form of technology. And so I'm not opposed to an energy transition if that's how it plays out, but it certainly shouldn't be the product of top-down public policy, which is what it is today. Just just direct because I think this is useful. Yeah. Do you think that's a fair distinction between even where the Trump administration was in its policy, you know, smart, sensible, rational policymaking, taking the energy transition as given – Versus the distinction that I would draw versus where I am, which is rejecting the premise of the energy transition itself. Is, is that a fair distinction? Yeah. I, I mean, to be honest, I actually don't think what we're saying is all that dissimilar. I despise targets. I, I hate because those are political objectives, not engineering ones. So when people come out and say we need to be net whatever by 2030, 2040, 2050, throw all that out. I, I, I deplore governments setting targets for where we can go. But I'm a capitalist, and the reason I am bullish on solar plus storage is because I actually think the economic case for solar plus storage is getting pretty good. Now, there's no question at their onset, the growth in renewables was driven by subsidies, mandates, and regulations. But renewables are big business now, and there is an opportunity to capitalize on that, bring down costs for consumers, and make money in a market-driven way. I want government out of this completely. If I am willing to risk capital in a solar plus storage business and I can monetize that and successfully capitalize it while bringing down costs for consumers, I want to do that. But as a capitalist, like the mantra you'll hear in capital yeah. markets is that climate risk is investment risk. You're getting ahead of that. I don't but, buy into any of that. Okay, fine. Forget that. I'm making smart investment decisions, Perfect. not because I'm trying to save how the do planet. You, how do you, from an investment perspective, take into account China risk then? Right? Because, because a lot of those inputs, Part of that low cost framework, the cost yeah. versus the benefit depends on being able to get those cheap component parts from China. Suppose I'm president. One of the things I've said is we're decoupling from China yeah. because of long term geopolitical concerns of the United States being economically dependent on an enemy. I think that that would be a nightmare scenario. The Putin problem we talked about is child's play compared to actually having a principal source of US energy, say solar, depending on getting actual inputs from Shenzhen. Suppose that we think forward and say, hey, we're cutting that off. That completely throws a wrench in the solar business model, does it not? So here, here is how I think we can thread this needle. And that is that we got to invest here at home, here in America. I mentioned at the start of this, I'm from Kentucky. Um, I have seen firsthand what happens in Kentucky when coal plants are shut down and the mines that feed them go away. There are so many ancillary jobs that are tied to those coal plants and the mines that feed them that entire communities basically are decimated overnight when this generation shuts down. And there's not a Burger King or a Walmart for 30 miles where someone can go to get alternative form of employment. And oftentimes, the only asset that people in these communities have are their homes, and their homes lose all value because nobody wants to move to an area without hope for economic prosperity. And so essentially what happens is people are left with a choice to either move away from their homes and their communities that they've known, in many cases, multi-generation, because they've watched their parents and their grandparents before them go into the mines, or go on government assistance. And when the jobs move out, the drug dealers move in, and it's a devastating crisis that we're facing in Appalachia. So if we are going to focus on subsidizing supply, like you said, and address the China crisis, what I don't want is government to be picking and choosing winners and losers and saying, well, these blue states are going to be the beneficiary of our federal largesse because they are the ones who are supportive of the clean energy transition. I'm diabolically opposed to that. We better start putting these jobs in, and, and creating these things in the communities that supplied this country with energy for the last 125 years. But why should that call let them in the first place? So and why again, do we have to take that as a premise is, is the question versus saying let's actually – then if you want to bring it back over here, be independent from China, it goes back to subsidies for solar. Like I'm, I'm just – I'm at a place where maybe you could call me 10 years behind. Maybe I'm 10 years ahead. Depends on whether I'm elected, I suppose, depending on which of those is the case. But 
I just reject the anti-carbon agenda that calls for the shutdown of those coal plants. So look, I come from coal country, big believer in coal, um, but I'm a straight shooter. The biggest thing that has led to the decline of coal has actually not been, regulation definitely played a, a significant role in it. The Obama administration pushed regs that actually were ultimately blocked by the courts, but the damage was already done. Utilities saw this mercury air toxic standard coming. They saw the EPA clean power plan coming. And even though ultimately these things did not move forward because they were blocked in the courts, preemptively they made decisions to shut down these plants. And once they're shut down, you can't It's very hard them. to, yep. The other piece to this that cannot be ignored is, you know, the economic coal case for coal prior to the past couple of years has suffered because of cheap natural gas. Natural gas has played a significant role in pushing coal sure, out of the enough. market pace on cost. So again, for me, overly burdensome regulations for the EPA that hinder coal production in this country, I'm diabolically opposed to. Natural gas being cheaper and more affordable for utilities and for consumers, displacing coal, I have less of a problem with that because that's that's a market functioning the way it's supposed to function. Yeah, it's a question. It, it'd be an open and interesting counterfactual as to let's say it was just the market competing without the i would say handcuff supply to the coal sector and without the subsidies applied to solar to sort of replace it or, or wind etc where we would be in terms of what that natural market equilibrium would look like i suppose it's an unanswerable question right because because these factors all came into play and and we and at the end of the day until it can be successfully stored Electricity is not a commodity, un, you know, like apples, right? And so, uh, when we talk about markets for electricity, you know, these are algorithms, right? Like these aren't pure markets, um, and and that's just the reality. We talk about markets, but these aren't actual. Totally. Markets. So, so we're going to um, definitely want to get to nuclear, which is what the heart of what I yeah. wanted to talk to you about. Where there's so much interesting preamble here, uh, so I'll go through one more, and then we'll finally get to nuclear because I don't want to run out of time, but. You know, I did travel this weekend in Iowa. I want to talk about carbon capture here for a second. And one of the big controversies in Iowa right now is this carbon capture plant or carbon capture pipeline, excuse me, that's capturing carbon that's the excess production of ethanol and other biofuels to build a pipeline across the state of Iowa to go bury it under the ground in the state of North Dakota. And the federal government is directly subsidizing that to happen. Now, the debate there is in order to actually build the pipeline, it's going to have to run through some land of some productive farmers who may or may not agree to the answer to that being yes, which may require invoking eminent domain to get it done. I visited with some farmers who sit pretty close to where that pipeline needs to run through. Most of them are dead set opposed to it. I have to, I have to admit I share their view in that like this is where the rubber hits the road, right? Certain forms of carbon capture, I mean, cap capturing methane and selling it as LNG, great. If a company wants to do that and make more money doing it, that's one thing. But this is a top-down version of the government saying, we're going to subsidize capturing carbon. It is the anti-carbon agenda at work. We're going to build a pipeline to bury it in the ground in North Dakota. And the rubber hits the road there where, like, even in terms of just surfacing your views on this, you and I are able to agree so vehemently because the other side has created these endless hypocrisies that we could spend hours pointing out. But when the rubber hits the road, I think I'm fundamentally against the use of that federal subsidy to ruin, I think, the lives of people to build a pipeline all the way through, including eminent domain, to take carbon from one place and bury it in the ground in a different state when nobody has still answered the question of why, to what end. Why is that inherently a desirable thing to do and to subsidize as a, as a society? And, and I think this would be, I, I think the 99% of things we agree on, we could go on for hours, but I think it's more important to maybe surface a couple of the areas where there's a little daylight. What would, what would be your, as someone who's a proponent of carbon capture, what's your reaction to that? Where would you come out on that type of issue? Policy driving this, not market forces. I'm, I'm with you completely. Okay. I don't think... Government policy should be making this determination. Even subsidizing carbon capture. Even subsidizing not, okay. carbon capture. You know, if you want to give tax credits for it, you know, and the like, but that shouldn't be the sole reason that it exists. And then eminent domain is being used for this. This, uh, this pipeline in Iowa would not exist with, without not for the federal subsidies, subsidy. no doubt about it. Yeah. So where it gets really interesting is you go beyond carbon capture, um, and and this is something that is hugely significant because it is happening right now at a massive scale: electric transmission. So. 
The Biden administration has these big objectives to go to decarbonize the economy. They invested $379 or $369 billion in the IRA to drive the clean energy transition. Some studies have shown that almost 80% of the benefits that are projected by the Biden administration from the Inflation Reduction Act will not materialize if we don't triple the pace at which we build transmission in this country. Uh-huh. Here is, again, back to the whole hypocrisy of the whole the thing. Historically, the opponents of energy infrastructure, because it's been fossil fuel infrastructure, have now become the proponents of building transmission lines to get clean energy onto the grid. And I was screaming this from the rooftop during my waning days at FERC, that you could not tie up natural gas pipelines and bureaucratic red tape and legal obstacles on the NGA side and not expect those same obstacles to apply on the Federal Power Act side when it comes to building transmission lines. And the irony of this whole situation now is now these proponents of putting clean energy on the grid are going to have their own playbook run against them. The playbook that they use to frustrate pipeline development and fossil fuel development is going to be used to frustrate transmission development and 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 really block their clean energy agenda. Because you nailed the core point. NIMBYism is not political. It's not ideological. Americans don't want energy infrastructure coming through their property. Period. Whether it's NIMBY being not my backyardism, not, so people not, know. Not, yeah. not my backyardism. Yep. The Kelo decision, which was the significant Supreme Court decision on eminent domain, that split. That wasn't a clean like liberals versus conservatives. There were conservatives who took the anti-eminent domain position. It is very, very difficult to build things in this country. And what I worry about now is back to your point about the climate religion, that in pursuit of the climate religion, we're going to ram through transmission and and frustrate fossil fuel development. That's why this permitting reform discussion that's happening in Congress is going nowhere. Because if you really wanted to do permitting reform right, you try and make it easier to build everything because it's too hard to build anything in this country. But the political left doesn't want to make it any right. easier. Permitting reform has to got to be that. top priority. And, and you yeah. t- technically sat within the Department of Energy. I think a big part of that permitting problem rests within the Department of Energy. It, it goes across multiple agencies. We played a critical role. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it's Does the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, also sit under the Department of Energy? I'm not familiar enough. I think they were formed under the Atomic Energy Act. I don't uh, okay. entirely know where they sit. Got it. So let's let's talk a little bit about nuclear energy, right? I think that the 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 question is if we want to unleash the power of nuclear energy in the United States, if you want the United States to adopt a leadership position in the world with respect to nuclear energy, to contribute to our energy self sufficiency and abundance, what is the best way to do it? So the challenge we've had for nuclear power, and and it's really materialized in the last kind of decade and a half. Um, you know, I was working as a staffer in Congress in the mid two thousands when there was talk of a nuclear renaissance in this country. We had I think about one hundred and four plants at the time, and there was talk about going to two hundred plants, and that renaissance fizzled because of a couple of critical factors. When was that one hundred four plants in? Uh, we were looking to double them. You know, I don't recall when, when what was the this time back frame when? was. It about 2008. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, about, about a decade timeline. and a half ago. About a decade and a half ago. And, and we, we probably don't have that many more plants than that today. We have fewer. Fewer, we're, I yeah. think we're down to 96, I believe. We've been going the other direction. We're shutting down plants. We're not opening new ones. And a couple of things have contributed to that. One, the Fukushima disaster in Japan uh, just you know raised a lot of questions around nuclear safety. And the NRC definitely doubled and tripled down with enhanced safety standards. And it's really hard to argue against them in the aftermath of a tragedy like that. This is what, 2011 or so? This is 2011. And it just layered on a bunch of additional costs on nuclear. You pair that up with, again, inexpensive natural gas and subsidized renewables, particularly the wind production tax credit, just made it really, really hard for nuclear plants to compete. And we find because ourselves- they, Because situation. wind got subsidies. Because wind got in. subsidies and natural gas was cheap and nuclear is expensive. Um, now this- In part because though of a regulatory regime. Because that of makes the regulatory regime around it. Um, you know, even there's talk of small modular reactors, uh, advanced nuclear, they still cost $6 billion. You know, when a gas plant is 500 million, it's tough to justify that. You know, you're talking about a nuclear asset, so you have to have an army to guard it 24 um, seven. You know, there's just a lot of things that make nuclear challenging, but we got to have it. You know, we've got to to have it if we want to, you know, have this really critical source of 
carbon-free baseload power. It's baseload power, which is a significant piece of this. But there's also a military component to this. If we abandon our civilian nuclear fleet for electricity, it sets us behind globally when it comes to nuclear security as well. So we got to have nuclear in the future, but we have to have a rational conversation about how we are going to go about this. And this gets back to the point I made earlier about markets and electricity. So the entire country is not in these competitive wholesale markets. The Southeast, for example, um, is not. It's uh, they're they're back, you know, old school, vertically integrated, um, you know, utility construct. Uh, so Southern Company, Georgia Power, they're building uh, the Vogel nuclear plant right now. When the cost overruns are done and it's finally completed, it's going to be re- like an astonishing number, like twenty seven billion dollars, and people are going to see that and they're going to panic. But Southern Company, Georgia Power, they'll show you when you look at what the impact will be on ratepayers long term. Uh, this is ultimately going to benefit ratepayers. Ratepayers will get the benefit of that clean generation. And, you know, over the course of time, despite the shocking initial number, that plant's going to pay for itself. And so that calls into question, you know, and and one of the things that you should look at should you uh, uh, become president of the United States, as you look at electricity and electricity markets, do these markets continue to make sense or do we need to go back to you know kind of bilateral contracts, which is what we have in the Southeast, which some people might say are effective? Now, I'm a big believer in markets. Um, I think. What, what do you mean by have, bilateral contract? So basically, that old school, you know, you have you have a utility, utility, you know, uh, uh, contracts, power purchase agreements. They sell their power. People buy the power, uh, and rates are uh, monitored by the state public utility. And that's commission. about it. When, when when did that system change? Actually, so we it's been about two decades since we uh, uh, there was a FERC order, FERC order eight eight eight, which opened the door towards market competition. And again, I'm a big believer. But in this markets is market competition. competition too, right? You're saying except for the fact that well, it's, it's a natural, monop- mono- natural it's monopoly. A natural power. monopoly. Yeah. It's natural monopoly power. But maybe that's what it takes to have a future for nuclear power, because quite frankly, nuclear struggles to compete in the the competitive market. So it's it's less it's less that it is regulated, but you allow for bilateral contracting as opposed Correct. to participating in the bidding. Correct. Process. And, I mean, and there's still a regulatory function at the state level there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pretty interesting idea, actually. So how would that work, actually? Like, let's just say you've got a plant. You would then go to the customer? I mean, it's a DTC model almost? So people can pull out of these these markets. And so when I moved at FERC with this minimum offer People price can pull out means individuals. Generators. Generators. So, okay, uh, so for instance, there was a, a utility in Virginia that when I moved on the minimum offer price rule, it was going to make their investment in offshore wind non-competitive rather than lose that investment in offshore wind without getting too deeply into the weeds. They pursued an off-ramp within the FERC rules that enable them to get out. So of out of the, the market, market means out of the FERC rules, Out really. of the FERC rules. And, and who are they bidding for? Like, how does that, how does that work? Because I think in understanding how this there are off-ramp these would work, quasi, I need to understand the status quo. They're score. non-governmental. They're, they're, they're private entities. But there are these things called RTOs and ISOs, regional transmission organizations and independent system operators. Uh, that I didn't know about this. Regional transmission like, organizations. Yes. Uh, you're in one right now here in Ohio. Uh, AEP, First Energy, uh, Buckeye uh, uh, Electric Co-op. They These participate are like non-profits. in a market called PJM. And PJM is the market overseer. So they run these forward capacity auctions. What's PJM? That is, uh, it is a, a what region it for, that controls, it's 13 states okay. from uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, fine. all the way down Pennsylvania, into Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, PJM. Um, and okay. so that is the market. That's the big market that serves this region of the country. And so one of the things that First Energy got into was their nuclear units were non-competitive in that market. And so they moved legislation in Ohio uh, to subsidize those nuclear plants and those coal Who plants. Who is First Energy, sorry? That's a utility out of the Cleveland area, big utility okay. in Ohio. So that's the – but it's a private it's regulated a private monopoly. Regulated monopoly. And then PJM is the market overseer that that runs the market that the utilities participate. And so First Energy decided to, not, to, to abandon nuclear. Why? To subsidize the nuclear because it wasn't competing. So they passed legislation at the state level to subsidize their nuclear plants – because those nuclear plants were out of the money, were way far out of the money. So who passed the legislation? The Ohio legislature. Yeah, passed the legislation to subsidize nuclear. Correct. Because otherwise First Energy would have abandoned it and shut down the plant. Would have had to. They, they were they were uneconomic. Otherwise. And so then what happened? So following that subsidy. So there was a bribery scandal. It was yeah, a that's the whole thing. Okay, got it, got it. That was the one. But, but, but 
put the boring politicking corruption thing to one side for a second, <laughs> yeah. though that's what ends up happening when you have these subsidies in yeah. these markets. What ended up happening though? Did it get subsidized? Did the nuclear still continue? And, and so First Energy is in the process right now of selling off their nuclear business to an independent power producer. I think the NRC still has to approve the transaction. There are still some things that have to happen, but they're selling off those. So units. if we were to if they were to opt out of this entire system, yeah. market as you call it, although we could put air quotes right. around that. What does that mean then? As an uh, alternative? you know, probably uh, Ohio ratepayers would probably have to bear the cost of that. Um, it, it, you know, so individuals, individual, consumers. so individuals, consumers would contract and say, "Hey, I'll pay well, this they, much." They don't have the option. They they pay their utility bill every month. Okay. The Ohio PUC would determine whether the rates were justifiable, were just and reasonable, and if the Ohio PUC signs off on whatever the utility's proposal is for rates. Ratepayers are held hostage to the monopolist utility. They have to pay their utility bills if they want power. Okay. This is confusing. <laughs> it's actually kind of complicated. Market it's complicated. structure market here. Market structure, market dynamics, and utilities. So status get quo common. would be you've got first energy that that's, you know, providing non-nuclear source, what's natural gas. We've got a bunch of other status quo would be first energy's nukes can't compete in the market. So Ohio residents would get power from other states that is cheaper than the First Energy nukes, and um, that's how the market would work. First Energy as a utility would suffer because their units were getting dispatched. Ohio consumers would benefit because they can get cheaper cost power from their neighboring states. First Energy moves in to subsidize those nuclear units on the backs of Ohio taxpayers. Then suddenly, those taxpayers are bearing the brunt of uh, those non-competitive. Units. Got it. Just, 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 just to sort of step back again, yeah. just to sort of think about how we would foster nuclear energy without having to resort to subsidies to do it. it. Sounds like the easiest way to do it, in your view, might be to have nuclear power providers step outside of this entire regulatory regime, invest private capital right. to be able to build up a natural monopoly – and then contract privately with individuals or no, that's not what you're saying. That's not how it works. That's so not how it works. Like, what's going to happen in, in Georgia power? Yeah. This nuclear plant's going to come online and the costs of that nuclear plant are going to be borne by rate payers, people who pay their electricity bills in the region that will be served by the nuclear plant. And over the course like, of how time, does that happen, it's going to price out. So, so uh, Georgia power comes to the Georgia PUC. Yep. They have a rate. Uh, proposal that they put before the PUC. PUC the, means the, the Public Utility pub, public Commission of Georgia. Of Georgia evaluates the rates. So they still say, a state regulator. Still there. a state regulator. The state regulator takes a look at it and says, "Okay, this is what the utility says they need to uh, cover their costs, plus you know make a marginal profit." We think this is a just and reasonable proposal. We think it's fair. We either approve it or reject it. It's not it. really a market point at all. It's, it's not. Just a, it's, it's just a, it's, some state right. regulator saying it. Correct. And then what happens? And then people it, just have to pay it. You just have to pay your bill under state law. Uh, under, I mean, that's the utility compact that we have in this country. Yeah. So the question of whether or not actually nuclear power competes is really cashed out not by the market, but by a state regulator who says, is this a just and reasonable, just price and fair proposal? Over time. And that's the challenge because in those competitive markets, and quite frankly, you know, in terms of investing private capital right now, really hard, even though the long term bet is a good one. In the short term, and that's one of the problems of this country, quite frankly, is the challenge that we have when we're competing against China is there's no long-term vision. We yep. make decisions based on, in politics, electoral cycles, of course. in business, based on quarterly you know, earnings reports. There's no long-term decision-making. And so a $20 billion nuclear investment over 80 years might make a lot of sense. But if you're a utility CEO or on our board and you're confronted with a decision of building a $20 billion nuclear plant or a $500 million gas plant, even though you might have to replace that gas plant you know, multiple times over the lifespan of the nuclear plant, in the short term, $500 yeah. million for a gas plant is a and lot by the easier way, to sell than And by the way, if that wasn't going to happen plant. in a decade of ultra low interest rate environments where you discount cash flows in the future by even you know a lower amount. Yeah. Now, in a rising interest rate environment, that becomes even less likely to happen just on the math of how present values are That's calculated. Right. You follow what I'm saying? You know, I think that the real, the real question is, I think a lot of people in the nuclear energy industry and investors in the space would say that it is, it is the regulations imposed by the, the 
you know, Nuclear Regulatory Commission by the NRC that effectively is designed to make the math of that very difficult, where the cost of building a new reactor or even to maintain an existing reactor is designed by the NRC to be prohibitive. And so it's less that it naturally has that property, but it's just that it has that property in a world in which the federal regulations are what they are, such that the price you would need in order for the state regulator to say that was just and reasonable price are mismatch. And I think the question then becomes what we do with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is something we'll dive into in another in another episode. Uh, I'll just give you one quick take on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So the agency I oversaw, FERC, we have about 1,500 employees. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has 4,000 yeah, yeah, employees yeah. who are all really, really, really smart people. You give 4,000 really, 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 really smart people uh, time – they're going to come up with stuff. <laughs> and, sure. And also culture. And, and because, culture. because this, is, this has become part of the culture of that organization. So I have to be, you know, just to be super candid with you. We're, we're making a list of what agencies we would have to shut down, potentially replace with something new to take its place. But the culture having become so ossified that it couldn't simply be reformed through a top-down mandate from the U.S. president to the administrative agency – Nuclear Regulatory Commission is is on the list we're looking at very carefully, our team is, of saying that might have to be one of the agencies that if you're actually going to unleash the power of nuclear energy in the United States, you need to bring a completely different prism to looking at the problem where the right answer, it'll have its costs, but will be to shut down the NRC and then rebuild something new to take its place with an actual offensive mentality rather than a pure protection standard that the NRC has applied, which has proven to be prohibitive for actually building new, pl- new power, new nuclear plants. I, I leave it to experts in the nuclear space to look into that. One thing I'd love for you to give some thought to that is in my area of expertise. So FERC is an energy regu- regulator, it's an economic regulator. Right. It's not an environmental regulator. EPA, obviously, environmental regulator. FERC, bipartisan board, five people. EPA, single administrator who can you know unilaterally act and make decisions. I'd love to merge EPA into FERC. Interesting. People talk about it doing the other way. I don't want FERC going into EPA. I want EPA to come into FERC Make EPA regs subject to notice and comment periods and five-person votes, not unilateral action from a single administrator. Yeah, that would – you know, in the spirit of practical solutions, that's actually something that's uh, it's pretty interesting. And we've been looking into the presidential reorganization powers that's actually codified in a statute that Congress passed. There's parts of it that were supposed to expire, parts that haven't, that actually could empower a U.S. president to do exactly things like that. Great conversation, Neil. Really enjoyed it and uh, learned a lot. Now, I have a feeling you and I are going to be chatting much more. Thank you so much for having me. Great. I'm Vivek Ramaswamy, candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Vivek 2024.